have pictures at the, of the Georgia Senate still at work. It's expected to be a long night under the Georgia Gold Dome. 236 elected officials, two chambers, hundreds of bills, and it all comes down to this final day, signy die. Good evening and welcome to our special one hour lawmakers as the 2024 Georgia General Assembly wraps up. I'm Donna Lowry in Atlanta. As always, tonight's action in both chambers could last well into the night or even early morning. Lots of important legislation is already headed to the governor's desk. The governor will join us live from the Capitol during the show. So will House Speaker John Burns and several other lawmakers. In the studio, we'll have analysis on this session and on the events that unfold tonight. But first, we get the latest from Capitol correspondent Sarah Callis, who is live at the Capitol. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Donna. Both chambers are still hard at work passing bills on the last day of the session. Longtime Secretary of the Senate David Cook was honored today as the Lieutenant Governor announced his retirement from the chamber. Just a few months ago, David came to me and he wanted to meet with me in my office, which I'll, you always know there's something when somebody wants to meet with you one on one, there's something that they got on their on their heart they need to tell you. And he said, I think it's time for me to uh, go do something else. I'm, I'm ready to retire. A video tribute was played for Cook who first started in the Senate in 1973 as a bill reader. I was reminded of a, what I will call a wise man. He said, one of life's most underappreciated talents is the ability to know when it's time to move on to life's ne next chapter. And I think that time has come for me at this point. Thank you for the, giving me the greatest uh, uh, honor and privilege of my life to serve as your secretary. For it was you, the Senate, who nurtured me and gave me an opportunity to serve. I'll never forget that and will always be grateful. Thank you. Cook wasn't the only one to announce their leaving. I've had the opportunity to travel this state, visit most of you, and attend events and hearings that were needed to address situations and concerns throughout Georgia. And I have been very, very, <clears throat> excuse me, honored to be here. Horacina Tate first took office in 1999, serving in the same Atlanta Senate district as her father, Horace Tate. The Senate then started the process of passing bills on the long last day. A variety of House bills were removed from the desk for consideration, including HB 500, which increases the punishment for intentionally damaging a law enforcement vehicle. These cars are very expensive, not just to purchase, but all the equipment that goes into those cars from radios, lights, sirens, safety equipment, et cetera. This simply is going to raise that offense up to a fine of up to $100,000 or by imprisonment between five and 20 years and or both. That bill passed 36 to 18, a bill that would privatize some water systems in Bryant County as they create new housing for workers at the new Hyundai plant under construction, created a lot of debate over private water systems. Private systems have been out there for generations, decades. This is not new. There are over a thousand, there are thousands of private water systems throughout the state. They are in every county. Opposition to HB 1146 was bipartisan. By allowing a private water company to come in, if you think about your circulatory system, you're trying to get blood down here to your arm, and we come in here and a private water system builds right here, the, you know, the rest of your system will work, but that part that's cut off is not going to get water. It opens the floodgates for unrestricted private access to precious water resources, essentially putting them up for sale for the highest bidder. Private water, what could go wrong? That bill passed 32 to 22. The House started slow and steady, passing a bill that would restrict social media in schools. SB 351, called the Protecting Georgia's Children on Social Media Act, would require schools to educate students about social media and block social media access on school devices and Wi-Fi. It also requires parental approval for minors to join social media. We had a young student uh, not far from my district in Johns Creek by the name of Nathan come and testify 
and he aptly used a uh, song from the 80s, uh, Every Rose Has a Thorn, and, and that's social media in, in this generation. It's great for connectivity, activism, but it has its thorns, and it's reared its ugly head and mental health and the impact on our children. Opponents of the bill express concerns that it could inhibit schools from using modern technology. I know the schools throughout the state right now use YouTube, and I am still looking for the carve out. As social media is defined on lines 565, as all of the, as social media is anything that allows content to be uploaded and commented on, i.e. YouTube, except for these carve outs. What this will mean that is, in a lot of schools, as people travel the world through YouTube videos to educate their children, that will now be forbidden under this bill. So we're going to be handicapping the teachers. The bill passed 120 to 45. The House also passed H.R. 1022 and H.B. 581 to update the homestead tax exemption. And House Bill 974, which places watermarks on election ballots and allows online access to view cast ballots following an election. The House and Senate are continuing to amend legislation and bandy bills back and forth between chambers. This process is expected to go on throughout the night. The Senate also passed controversial puberty blockers bill, House Bill 1170. It still has to go back to the House for final approval before the end of the night. That's all for my Capitol report. Back to you, Donna. Thank you, Sarah. And we look forward to your interviews from the Capitol throughout the show. Well, now with us in the studio for this hour-long show are two veterans of Sine Die to offer analysis. First, former state senator Jen Jordan served the Atlanta area from 2017 to 2023. She's a native of rural Dodge County in middle Georgia. She's an attorney with the Somerville firm. Also here is Phil Kent. He is the CEO and publisher of James Magazine and Insider Advantage, a daily online news outlet. He's a journalist and frequent commentator on politics and public policy issues on the Georgia Gang. Thank you both for coming on, lawmakers. Appreciate having you here. Thanks, Tom. So, it's here. We're, we're finally wrapping this <laughs> all up. It always seems long, but let's talk a little bit about what you thought of this session. And so and I'm going to start with you, Phil. What did you overall thoughts? Well, just a few takeaways. Uh, number one, the Republicans uh, pledged that uh, the state income tax would eventually be gone. So they're partially reducing it uh, each session. So every taxpayer ought to be happy that uh, that's going on. And uh, there was certificate of need reform. Health reform is always a big issue uh, with both parties. And so uh, with the CON law, uh, it actually helped rural hospitals uh, get new equipment or be built easier in, in, before you had to go hat in hand to get uh, permission. And so then there's immigration control and a few other things we'll be talking about. Yeah, so it, it, there was a lot, actually, more in early on than I've seen in, in previous years. Your overall thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we have to remember this is the second part of a biennial. Um, so you come in that second year of a biennial and you have all of the backlog um, from the bills that didn't make it over the year before. And so that's why it's kind of easier to get a lot more done in the beginning, right? Um, but then things kind of slow down and, and, and folks kind of do a check but this is also an election year. And that's where, in terms of what I really noticed, is that there were a lot of culture war bills that were being filed and pushed because you have a lot of Republicans specifically who are having to go home um, and fight these primary battles. And so they need to be able, you know, to be able to show certain base, base voters, you know, that they were able to get some of these culture war issues over the line. What's interesting is a lot of those bills came out after crossover day in, in, a, in, a, in a way where they came in another bill. And I think that's been controversial. Well, it's controversial, but it's not it's unusual. Part of what <laughs> we've what, seen. The part this. of the process. The Democrats used to do it, and now the Republicans do it. Uh, and so you find a vehicle, and uh, then you start negotiating and horse trading. And so uh, we were talking. Jen's talking about the so-called cultural wars. Well, uh, I think a lot of uh, Georgians, uh, regardless of your party label, want. Uh, uh, I, I think they want actually male in, in male bathrooms and females in female bathrooms and locker rooms. I don't think that's a 
conservative Republican issue. So that was one of the things that was added after a crossover. Yeah. So that, that bill has a lot in it. It has that. It has transgender, not teaching, transgender right. uh, but it also not teaching sex education until after sixth grade. Right. So there, there was a lot in there. And the uh, the lawmaker who originally had that bill, Representative Omari Crawford, was pretty disappointed by the changes in that. Yeah. And what what happens is called stripping a bill. So what they'll do is they'll take a bill on the other side, like so it passes out of the House, it comes to the Senate, right? Then a senator, um, a Republican senator, because it's always the party in power, will strip the bill of all that language and put whatever language they want to put into that bill. And the whole point of that is to really circumvent the requirement of crossover, which is that it's actually um, been vetted by one house before the day of crossover. And, and it's about due process and making sure that, that people are working the process appropriately. So while stripping happens a lot, um, it really isn't a good thing in terms of democracy and people really knowing what's going do down at the Capitol. Um, and also, there's all kinds of things that can be put in there. I mean, not only do you have this bathroom stuff, but you know, you're not even supposed to refer to um, you know reproduction when you're teaching sex ed to kids. I mean, it, it's one of those things where that if, if folks knew what was really going on down there at the Capitol and what was contained in a lot of these bills, they would be pretty outraged, I think. Any response you want? Well, I think that um, sometimes it's still got to be voted on and agreed to by both chambers, and uh, the opposition party can say what they want. You're still having debate, like even tonight, uh, on these things. And so a lot of times there's horse trading, and uh, if you were frustrated... Now, some of these bills have had hearings already, uh, even though they may be uh, put on another vehicle. So I don't have that big a problem with it like Jen well, does. And, and, and look, the, the problem is a lot of times these bills have had a hearing and then they weren't voted out of those committees. Right. Um, they weren't considered, even by the Republicans who were leading these committees, to be worthy um, of even getting a vote on the floor. You're correct, but as you well know, having served, th there's horse trading and people say, well, you know, Donna, if you're not for my bill, then I'm not for yours, and then they have to figure it out later. A lot, use a vehicle to get it through. Yeah, a, a lot of that taking place also. There is the pos Now, it's passed in the Senate, but there's a possibility that now that it goes back to the House, some things can happen, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the more that you tweak with the bill, um, the more problematic it becomes in terms of actually getting it over. Every time it's amended, then it has to go back through this more extensive process. And look, you can really see that there is tension between the Senate and the House right now, the Republicans, right? Um, in terms of the Republicans in the House really seem to think that they are just trying to, to get the business done and do what they need to do. And while they think that the Republicans in the Senate really are just trying to throw these bombs, these political bombs. How long can it go back and forth? For instance, I guess till the, the night ends, what, for one thing, but, you know, the, it came out of the House and went to the Senate, it was changed, so they amended, since it goes back to the House, they can make some changes too, right? Yeah, and then, but the more, like I said, then it get, pops back exactly. and back and forth, and then, you know, well, you just get to betting. the point where it look just stops. Look at sports betting. Let's for four years, that. it's been going on yes. back and forth. Now, that's right. not Republicans and Democrats. They're, that's kind of a No, and look, I stripped the bill thing. as a committee chairman to put sports betting on it right. with Burt Jones to try to get that over the line right. three years ago um, as someone who represented the Braves and, and most so of the owners. stripping the bill can be good. <laughs> it can be good, but guess what happened? It didn't go anywhere I then. Know. The difference, though, is where's Burt Jones today? He's not just a member of the Senate, but he's a lieutenant governor, and if he wants that bill and he's pushing it, um, we've seen kind of the reaction in, in how the different um, Republicans on both sides have, have kind of been much more supportive than they were even a year or two ago. Yeah. I think that the thing for the freshman, the freshman representative was that he was very sincere about his bill. It dealt with mental health for athletes. He actually came on the show and he talked about, he showed his coach's picture and talked about his, how his coach was a big 
big into mental health for athletes and that kind of thing. And then he, he kind of lost it. So those are the kinds of things that people <laughs> don't quite understand. They're like, okay, what happened? Well, and he told me. A good learning curve for a freshman. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> and as I told him it was like baptism by fire. Like you kind of you kind of figure that kind of thing out. But there are a lot of little things that people don't understand that are, are going to take place. Give people an idea of even how the night might, might go in terms of it, first of all, the legislative day ends when the legislative day ends. It doesn't end at midnight. Right. It, it, it historically has supposed to end at midnight. The last few years, it'll go five, it'll go ten. One of the more interesting things about the legislature, though, is that the House and the Senate, they have to end at the same time. Um, so there's literally, that's why when you go into the Capitol and you open the doors to the Senate gallery and you look across, you can open the doors to the House gallery. And so the Speaker of the House and the Lieutenant Governor are, used to be they could look at each other and then basically make the sign. Now there's an actual phone call that comes across so that they'll gavel out. I don't think a lot of people knew that. Yeah, that's an interesting insight. I, I did read that in 2017, though, the session extended to 12:47 right. a.m. Yeah, that, <laughs> that they can the go. Longest. They can Much, go as long as they want. Yes, they they can, but it really is supposed it's to. It's by law, isn't by it? By law, it's yeah. supposed to end. They've been and breaking so you're the law. Starting to, <laughs> well, and look, you, you you're just setting up a challenge for for a very controversial bill, maybe that makes it over the line after 12 o'clock. Yeah. Let's talk about one thing that we haven't seen yet, and they've got to. The one thing they have to do is the budget, and it, it comes back in the house. There's. Um, we assume that some things are going back and forth right now between the, the two chambers, but the how we will see a budget tonight. Well, we will, by yeah, law. We have That's to. the one thing they have to do. <laughs> the only thing they the have to do. The only thing they have to do. And, and Jen and I were talking earlier about this is later than usual. And um, obviously, there's some cuts that want to be made in one house, and uh, the other house doesn't want to do that. Some people want to do last minute additions. So that's been going on. Yeah, the other thing that's interesting about this year is there is money. And so that, you know, I think in years when, when there were, there wasn't enough money, uh, you would have expected this to be uh, more contentious. But there's money, so maybe that maybe that's the reason it is contentious. Well, and it, it can be contentious because how do you spend that money, yeah. right? Um, usually when you're having to tighten, you know, tighten up, people really are like, okay, we want to be responsible. But when there is surplus to go around, a lot of these folks from these various districts want to make sure that maybe that surplus goes to their people. It's all about priorities. It, it is. It definitely is. Well, we're going to continue to talk to both of you, but we have a very special guest right now. Um, joining us now from the Capitol is G uh, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Governor. Hey, good evening. Glad to do it. I know it is a busy, busy time for you. Uh, so let's let's get started. And I know in a few minutes you're going to talk to the, both of the chambers. Can I give us a preview of what you're going to talk to them about? Yeah, really just going to thank them for embracing the bold vision that we laid out in our state of the state address uh, just, you know, a little less than three months ago. Thank them for raising teacher pay and educator pay. Thank, him for, thank them for accelerating uh, the largest state income tax cut that we've done in history that's going to save Georgia taxpayers $3 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, historic investment in the transportation infrastructure in the budget and a lot of other things. Really just going to say thank you. I know they've got a lot, a lot of work left to do, still got to pass the budget, but uh, they're getting there. Yeah, I know you had some priorities. How are you feeling about some of your priorities this session? Yeah, thankfully, we got most everything that we needed to do and things that I had mentioned in the state of state, whether it's human trafficking legislation uh, and, and obviously our first step on historic tort reform that we plan on doing uh, done um, a couple of days ago. So really today we've just been working on some, some percolating issues that have been some disagreements on between the House and the Senate, trying to help them get bills into a better place make them understand where we have issues from the executive branch or the agency side of things. And so we've been very busy doing that today, uh, and I'm sure we will be the rest of the night. Well, I want to talk to a couple of the leaders that have talked to me, and they've mentioned that they wish they could have done more with tort reform this year. What are your thoughts about that? Well, listen, I, you know, I talked about that before session started and where we were. I mean, everybody in this building worked really hard on tort reform last year. 
uh, but nothing could get done. And when we talked to everybody about what they actually wanted, nobody could really point to what was specifically going to help stabilize or lower cost. And so we came up with a plan to pass a bill, which we've gotten passed, I look forward to signing, that will give us the data that we need to come back over the next year or two and take some rifle shots at tort reform. There's, there's been a couple of good uh, things that have passed this year, so we've main, made the first step there, but we got more work to do, and I'm looking forward to taking the lead on that next year. Okay, so we'll see some more next year then. There was some movement this session, even among Republicans, for some type of Medicaid expansion. That hasn't happened. What are your thoughts, given that you advocated for your Patients First Act? Well, we're continuing to have great success in the two waivers that we have, despite the Biden administration trying to block uh, our Medicaid expansion. This is a conservative expansion that, that goes along with work requirements and, and education requirements and other things that we think is really the way to go in our state. You know, bringing Medicaid expansion up two or three days to go in the legislative session, in my opinion, is not very good legislating and is quite honestly a terrible idea. Uh, people have been talking about the Arkansas plan and these other plans. Uh, the fact is, the plan that was proposed would take over 700,000 people off of private sector health insurance and put them on the government roll. Nobody ever talked about what that's going to cost. Nobody ever asked people that are on private uh, sector health insurance whether they wanted to go to, you know, a single payer government run health care. Many people do not. So I, I think that's a terrible idea. Uh, we've been glad to continue to talk with the legislature on these issues like we did last year when we expanded Medicaid up to 12 months for birth and mothers to deal with uh, some of our more maternal mortality issues. And, you know, the other side talks like we hadn't done anything, Don, and we've done a lot. We got a lot in the budget this year dealing with those things as well. And we're going to keep working hard on those issues. I know Patients First Act just really got rolling last year, didn't it, sir? Yeah, the private sector side of that, of opening up the markets to hardworking Georgians across the state has been incredible. We've, we've put over 1.3 million people on the rolls. We've reduced premiums anywhere from 11% up to, say, 25% in rural markets where there was only one market uh, or, or one company available to price a market. Um, you know, our Medicaid side of things did get slowed down because the Biden administration has fought us tooth and nail every step of the way. We actually had to sue them to implement this policy that the federal government approved. Uh, so it's been very frustrating dealing with that side of things, but we're off and rolling now and are looking forward to continuing to work on that issue. Uh, and, and we'll continue to educate the legislature on that as well. Well, I know you spent several years experiencing sine die in the chamber. So here it is. Can you describe it a little bit for people, uh, you know, who, who haven't experienced it before, what it's like? And, and do you miss it at all, sir? Well, I, I'm in, uh, very happy where I am right now. Uh, it is organized chaos down here. This is uh, a day where we really have to be on our toes to make sure that we know what's passing and what's not and trying to make you know, keep bad things from happening, but help support good things that, that are happening and making sure that we're continuing to have a fiscally conservative government, have less government in our state, have less regulation. And sometimes on crazy days like this, things that do the opposite will happen. So uh, we are very focused on, on fighting that fight tonight and working with the members of the General Assembly. But regardless of, uh, of the work part of it, uh, it's certainly an exciting evening. These folks have been working hard uh, as our people have for over three months, and we, we appreciate their public service. And, and in that way, it's a great and fun night to be at the Capitol. Yeah, I hear some bells ringing behind you, so they're busy. They really much are working very much tonight. Thank you so much, sir, for taking the time out to talk with us tonight, and have a great evening. You too. Great to be back with you. Thank you. All right, so we, we heard a lot from the governor there on a lot of different things, and uh, one of the things he talked about was, of course, the, the, there's, there's money going back to taxpayers. The tax cut was a, a big priority of his. That's right, and I think uh, everybody, that's one of the reasons why he's so popular in the polls. I think uh, 
he kept the state open, as we know, during COVID, and also he's been championing tax reform. And uh, he mentioned some of the money that's going to be going out. Uh, let's just take transportation, for example. Uh, I think both parties are in favor of targeted infrastructure. And I think, gosh, over $2 billion is going to be allocated for bridges, highways, and infrastructure, which is good. And, and he's right. Um, I think with Medicaid expansion, the Democrats, uh, it's too expensive. And I think that uh, at the last minute trying to get it through uh, was the wrong thing to do. Okay. All right, Jen? It's never been last minute, <laughs> Phil. I filed it. We filed it. They filed it at the beginning. They filed it every session, and they've tried to push. They really did think they could get it over the line this time because Republicans have seemed to finally see the light in terms of, of the economics around it and the fact that it could grow business in terms of, of rural hospitals in the state. But it didn't make it over the line, and really um, that's a disappointment and a real loss for the people of this state. Yeah. I think philosophically, uh, the governor laid it out, though. Um, uh, most Republicans and conservatives and even independents like private sector health insurance, and you don't want some sort of socialist, uh, you know, uh, single-payer program, which could cost billions over the next 10 years. Yeah, nobody likes socialist single-payer programs unless it's Medicare, right? So let, let's talk about exactly what this could do in terms of the coverage for a lot of people in this state that need coverage that can't afford private health care. It would have done some amazing, incredible things. And again, I know a lot of Republicans believe this too. It's a real loss for the state and it would have been a real um, feather in the governor's cap if he would have helped champion this and push it over the well, let's line. Let's give his yeah. program a chance. It's still new and uh, that's also helping low income people. Okay, we're going to talk about more in a moment, but I hear that Sarah has a guest right now, so we're going to go back to the Gold Dome. And Sarah, who are you talking with? Thanks, Donna. We're here with Speaker Pro Tempore, Jan Jones. Thank you so much for being here, Speaker Jones. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we only have a couple more hours left in the legislative session. What bills would you like to see pass? Well, uh, number one is the budget, and the conferees, myself included, we just signed it. So that is the most important thing we will do tonight, and uh, we'll, we'll get that. Uh, we have a couple of elections bills uh, to continue to make improvements uh, on election integrity that I think we'll try to get to. We got a immigration, couple of immigration measures that we'll try to finish up before the end of uh, before the end of the night. Um, those are really the main ones, and the, the budget particularly important because we have another significant raise for all state employees that uh, I very much want to see get done. Mm -hmm. And so you've been busy this session. What bills are you most proud of having passed? Uh, I uh, personally worked on um, on pre-K. I had a, led a study committee over the summer, and we're making uh, significant improvements to the program so that we can expand access and quality. Uh, we did part of that through legislation, but it's also the governor just approved an additional $48 million to go into pre-K so that we can accomplish those objectives. Um, I'm very proud of the, the bill that we, uh, that we passed on school choice. I worked very hard on that to provide more opportunities for children who, are, uh, who just need more options and their public school doesn't meet their needs. Um, what else am I? Well, I, I personally authored a bill that will double the parental leave time, paid parental leave for all state employees. Georgia, most people don't realize Georgia is the, the largest employer in the state, and two thirds of state employees are women. This is an important issue for them, and they will now have six weeks of paid parental leave instead of just three weeks. So, those are some of the things that I've been particularly proud of to work on this session. Well, thank you so much for being here. Donna, back to you and the guests in the studio. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate that. And coming up, we continue our hour-long lawmakers with more live interviews from the Capitol on this sunny die, the final day of the Georgia Legislative Session. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy. The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. 
put their faith in PBS because they know that it is constantly delivering quality. It covers the whole of the United States. It's a free and independent media. We go where the viewers are. What are the conversations that are happening right now? We feel that civil discourse is a civic responsibility. What we do is authentic reporting that people can trust. We give time so you can hear voices on all sides of an issue. This is the place that people turn to for stories that matter. And they know that when they walk away, they will have learned something about the world around them. That's why this makes PBS important for daily life and in the end, our world. Thank you for joining us. Community, learning, working, playing, celebrating. Doing life is always better together. At GPB, we aim to provide you with the tools to be able to do life together well. Our mission to educate, inform, and entertain inspires everything from our wide range of programming to our stimulating radio conversations to our fun in-person events. We've got something for everyone. Visit gpb.org community to learn more about our upcoming events. You're looking at live pictures of the Georgia House where they are busy working through the night to finish up on this 40th day of the Georgia Legislative Session. This is Sine Die. We're, this is, welcome back to Lawmakers. This is our one hour show and we're so happy to have you. We're happy to have Phil Kent and Jen Jordan with us talking about things. Before we went to the break, we heard from Speaker Pro Tem, Jan Jones, a little bit about a few things. Wanted to get your, your comments on some of the things she talked about. Yeah, one of the things that um, I think is important for un people to understand, and, and she's right, Georgia is, the state of Georgia is one of the largest employers in this state. But it, she talked about how she was able to double the, the parental leave time for, for state employees. And then she went on to say from three weeks to six weeks. Um, so my last legislative session, we actually finally passed just for three weeks. Prior to that, there was not even any maternity leave, period, across the board um, for um, employees of the state. And so the fact that at least there <laughs> is we're moving the ball a little bit, but it sounded great, right? It's like I doubled the time, and it's like, that is amazing. And then it's like, oh, just from three weeks to six weeks after you have a baby or if you're caring for a loved one or something, you know, we, we can we can kind of keep pushing that down the road. I so think. it was 2023, you're saying, that um, that's when it, would, it went to three weeks? I Anybody think it was 22, 22. Okay. 22 or 23. Okay. But it, before that, because I was I was pushing, I was like, what is maternity leave in the state of Georgia for your employees? And then I figured out we don't have it. If you work up at the Capitol, you did not have maternity leave. If you work for one of these agencies, you did not. Um, you had to basically bank sick leave in order to take that time then to take care of your baby. So if we're going to be all about families and prioritizing, you know, um, us being able to take care of our children, I think we need to kind of put our money where our mouth is. <laughs> A lot of focus on state employees this session in terms of more money in the budget for their salaries and, and those kinds of things. So there, there, you know, there, there's a lot to be happy about if you're a state employee. There, there is. There's one area of concern that should concern everybody, and that's the Department of Corrections, which is in crisis. Yeah. And I was hoping that there would be more money. Uh, they're having a staffing crisis. Uh, you've just had a warden shanked the other day. Um, you've had gangs. It's the biggest gang recruitment center in the state, or our state prison system, which is terrible. And I think there ought to be more focus on it, especially <laughs> next year. But I was hoping for raising the pay of those cor corrections officers. That's a thankless task. Well, they've already started to raise the pay. The problem is, is that there's so much corruption within the system. And That's in right. fact, if you look at the homicide rates, even prisoner upon prisoner, violence and, and deaths, um, it has quadrupled in the last few years. And it's really at a crisis level. The Department of Justice is down here looking into it. And we've got a situation where really the governor needs to call up the National Guard and have them there because it is so out of control. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. We can't get ourselves 
phones blocked in the state prison system. The federal system blocks the cell phones. I don't know why we can't do that here. And these drones are a real problem, uh, dropping who knows what it's, in prison walls. So I, I agree with you. It's amazing to think about those drones, too. But we want to, we've got live pictures of the, we spoke to the governor earlier. He's walking in right now into the house. And uh, so they will be hearing from him, but we got, we got an idea of what's happening uh, ahead of time. So he told us what, what he's going to be talking about a little bit. Uh, she talked also, um, a Speaker Pro Tem Jones talked a little bit about election integrity, immigration bills, some things that she would like to see, you know, go over the line tonight. So um, your thoughts on those, those issues. Let's talk election integrity first. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's tweaks around different um, areas with respect to the election stuff. Um, but the reality is, is there doesn't necessarily need to be a lot done. And, and we keep talking about election integrity and we kind of keep using that, that code language. Um, and, and I think people really need to trust the system and think that the system works. And the more that we talk about it in this way, I think it really does undermine people's um, trust and, and really makes them not think that the system is legitimate. Did some bills pass that people will be able to trust the system more? I mean, um, among other things, it's the being the public being able to see the ballots afterwards. Well, yeah, one of the bills is to remove the QR code. That's right. And um, I think that's a good thing. And, you know, we can always do better, and we always should be questioning the system uh, and see what we can do better. Um, you mentioned immigration, uh, illegal immigration control. There's two bills that the Speaker Pro Tem talked about, which I think are necessary. And uh, especially after the grizzly murder of, uh, of Lake and Riley by uh, an alleged illegal alien. And that is, um, let's have the sheriffs in the state and the jailers in the state be accountable. Under Georgia law, these terrible sanctuary jurisdictions are illegal, but there was no enforcement mechanism. So one of the laws wants to have uh, an enforcement section where you would penalize sheriffs and jailers that refuse to, uh, to, to obey the law. Well, and look, the problem is, is that the sheriffs aren't behind it. They're already stretched to the max um, in terms of what they're doing. And I know that, that a lot of folks came out and said, you know, you can't put this on top of everything else that you're already this making would us help do. help them. They just ask for a detainer and let the feds get somebody who's a violent it's an illegal. Un, it's an unfunded mandate like we've done time after time in these local jurisdictions. They are really getting to the point where they cannot do it anymore. And when you have sheriffs that are willing to stand up and say that, you know that there's got to be something problematic in that, and that just passing a law is just not going to get you there. There's at least 12 sheriffs that don't even ask the citizenship status of these people. They could at least do that so we could figure out who's here. Yeah. So the, the whole idea of sanctuary cities that has, there there's still a controversy as to whether they actually exist. They too. don't. They do. They, it, not in the state of Georgia, it, they don't yeah, they exist. Yeah, they do. athens Clark County, it was a prime example. And when the, the mayor there says, oh, you know, we're not going to ask the citizenship status of whoever comes in here. And look at what happened to Lake and Riley. That had nothing to do with the mayor asking about somebody's citizenship status. It, it, it absolutely, status. No, it, absolutely. It, no, and the sheriff not. was right no. in, in cahoots with the mayor it, in it athens Clark County. It did not happen. <laughs> did not happen. I'm, I'm going to put a pin in all of this discussion to talk about school choice. She talked about, you know, the school choice bill and how she is very she really wanted that to pass it was close but it happened uh, your thoughts on that well this this type of parental choice bill for schools actually is to target uh, the low producing schools in the state which I think is good and interestingly if you're looking at polling uh, a lot of uh, uh, minority and, and uh, uh, Democrat voters, frankly, are in favor of this. It's a bipartisan thing. And so I think we needed to have this. There's certain stipulations uh, of the parental choice bill. But uh, I think parents, and especially in a, in a low-performing school, ought to have a way to get out of there. Yeah, your thoughts. Well, the problem is most of the areas in the state don't have access to a private school, and this provides $6,000 um, toward that tuition, and the reality is you're not going to have enough people who actually use the allocation, and, and that's kind of the back door here. Um, if, if not everyone uses all of the money, then all of a sudden it's offered up to everybody, and, and that's when you start to say there's no accountability, nobody's actually checking. It could certainly to see help in Metro Atlanta that. where there are uh, choices and to try to get low income students out of their low performing schools. Listen, if, if, if 
$30,000 is the average cost of a private school in Metro Atlanta. If you are someone who is making minimum wage and barely making it and trying to feed your kids and the state of Georgia gives you $6,000 toward that $30,000, you do not have the money to take care of the rest Maybe of that. Maybe you could go to a show. charter school or something like a magnet school. Now, we're going we're to have to put a pin on this, too, because we've got somebody else at the Capitol. We're back, back at the Capitol where Sarah has an interview with, I believe, House Speaker, House uh, Minority Leader James Beverly. That's right, Donna. I'm here with House Minority Leader James Beverly. Thank you for being here, Lito Beverly. All right, so you were hopeful that this would be the session that Medicaid expansion passed, but it never made it out of committee. Can you explain what happened? Yeah, the governor. Uh, they could have just changed one or uh, two numbers on the poverty level, for federal poverty level from 100 to 138 percent, and it would have changed it, and we would be pulling down $1.2 billion right now from the federal government. And the governor's uh, just in his, you know, his decision, uh, he decided, no, we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. And so what are you hoping that next year's leaders do to help this cause? What, what I hope happens is that they pick up Medicaid again and that they really have a robust conversation over the summer about how to, how to expand it. And beyond that, we'll see. I, I mean, you know, I think that the next generation of leaders are going to come in and they're going to figure out what the work is supposed to be. And so we'll see uh, where, they, where they are next year. So this is your last year in the legislature after more than a decade here. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned? I think the biggest lesson I've learned is stay focused on the work. There's so many distractions. There's all kind of things that happen up here, uh, but you've got to stay completely focused on the work. Whatever that work is in the moment, stay focused on it because that is what's going to get you through. So no matter what the distractions are, you got to really stay focused on what is the work to move Georgia forward and what is the progress we're trying to happen, uh, trying to have happen in the whole state. And what's the most important work then during your decade here? Oh, wow. I mean, probably addressing poverty and really leaning into what does it look like and how do we try to eradicate poverty, not just in Bibb County, but also in the state of Georgia, and really focus in on that. And I think that's been a, one of the biggest accomplishments I had. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank Donna, you. back to you and the guests in the studio. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah. So it's, it's amazing to think that we're going to have a new minority party leaders in both the House and the Senate, because in the Senate, um, Leader Butler is leaving, Gloria Butler. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to change things a little bit, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, it's it was kind of a sad, bittersweet day, I have to say, because you've got David Cook, who is the secretary of the Senate, leaving, and he's been there forever. Um, and he really is the, the thing that never changes, right? He's the person who makes sure, sure the rules are followed, that the bills are copied appropriately, that everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. Um, he's not going to be there. And then you have Gloria Butler leaving. You have Horacina Tate leaving. You have a lot of people with a lot of experience and knowledge. Um, Valencia C., all of these folks that were there even when Democrats were in the majority, right? right? So long ago. <laughs> um, so that's how long they've been. So we, we're really seeing a, a a bit of a sea change in the Senate with respect to that. A lot of new people have come in. Right. So we're, we're going to go back to Sarah right now. She has somebody with her. Sarah? <laughs> Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Donna. I'm here with Senate Minority Caucus Chair Elena Parent. Thank you for being here, Senator Parent. Thanks for having me. All right, so you are an outspoken critic of House Bill 1104, which restricts transgender students' bathrooms and sports choices, and it also places bans on sex ed before sixth grade. Can you explain your thoughts on the bill? Well, I have a number of them. I mean, from everything from the way the process unfolded with um, amalgamating like six culture war bills, or maybe it's only four or five, onto a bill that dealt with student athlete mental health. Some of those bills didn't even get out of committee the first time, were never even heard. So they certainly weren't vetted. And I, first of all, was very upset because I feel like the people of Georgia have entrusted us to be thoughtful about making laws on their behalf. And the process that unfolded with that bill was anything but thoughtful and serious. And moreover, you know, they are incredibly divisive culture war bills that um, restricted a lot of people's rights. I really objected to the uh, no sex ed part of the bill, which I referred to as increased Georgia's teen pregnancy rate bill, um, because it requires a, a opt-in to sex education. It requires school boards to go through a very burdensome and lengthy process if they even wanted to try to offer a sex ed curriculum to their students. Um, and it, it says that you would still be able to talk about a few things like um, child abuse to make sure our students are aware 
of their ability to say no and prevent sexual abuse and also to explain to girls about menstruation. But the reality is you can't really do those things that it says you can do without touching on topics that are expressly forbidden under the bill. So the whole thing is an unholy mess, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so a similar bill, House Bill 1170, just passed the Senate. Yeah. And so that would restrict puberty blockers for transgender adolescents. What are your yeah. stances on the bill? You know, that bill is really difficult. It, um, there was an amendment by Senator Kay Kirkpatrick to try to at least grandfather in the young Georgians who are already on them, on puberty blockers, so that you don't just, like, force them to cut off medication cold turkey, which no doctor would ever recommend. Uh, and those failed, unfortunately. So we're in the position where we're literally telling uh, Georgians on a medication that they can't be on it anymore, no matter what, with no consideration about what medical consequences that might have, to say nothing of what um, the particular circumstances are for that George, that young person and their family that is working uh, with them. Mm -hmm. yes. So it's just a terrible idea. It's, it's actually another sort of culture war bill um, that itself passed committee in a very shady way. Um, and it's unfortunate that we're playing such games games so cavalierly with Georgians' lives. Mm -hmm. And that bill still has to pass the House. It we, does. We just Hopefully spoke, it won't. <laughs> and we just spoke to Leader Beverly about Medicaid expansion. A lot mm -hmm. of Democrats felt like you were close to get Medicaid expansion this session, but it seemed to sort of fall apart at the last minute. What happened there? Well, first of all, I want to say that I am very gratified that for the first time ever, there was a full committee hearing on the topic of Medicaid expansion. Uh, Peach Care Plus is what we were calling the plan in the bill. And it got a bipartisan vote in support, even though it didn't go over the finish line. Um, I think there were a lot of factors. I think Governor Kemp wasn't ready to throw his weight behind the uh, Medicaid expansion program. He still has some hopes pinned on his far more limited pathways program. The problem with that is that it has been um, it, pretty much a dismal failure in terms of signing Georgians up. There's only about 2,900 Georgians that have signed up, and it's cost $26 million. It's a no-brainer. It's incredibly clear that we just need to go ahead and expand Medicaid. But he wasn't willing to do that. And as a governor, he obviously carries a lot of weight with our Republican colleagues. So we will be continuing to fight for the 15th year in a row. I am gratified that we got one step closer this year, even though it's a shame uh, that we're continuing to not do this common sense health care program for our Georgians. Well, we'll see what next year holds. Thank you so much for being here. Donna, back to you and the guests in the studio. Oh, thanks so much. So she talked about uh, quite a few things. The, uh, the one thing that we hadn't talked about was the pu puberty blo blockers bill, 1170. Um, it looks like it, you know, the House will look at it, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Any thoughts? Well, I, I think that uh, Lena Perrin was talking about the, uh, the amendment by Senator Kate, right. uh, Kilpatrick, and, uh, which I thought was, was a good amendment. Uh, although, you know, this, this cliche that the Democrats always use, culture wars, culture wars, well, you know, this is something of importance to every citizen. I mean, just take, there's a lot to unpack in what she said, but just take women's sports, which is under attack. I mean, I think that uh, there ought to be biological males and biological females, for example, ought to be uh, separated when it comes to sports. Uh, we fought in the 1970s to get female sports, and now look what's happening. So I don't see anything, I, I would say the vast majority of Georgians, you know, want uh, separate sports. Okay, your thoughts. To be quite frank, I wish uh, Phil would bring that kind of ferocity to actually fighting for women's rights. <laughs> In the 1970s, we fought as women for women's rights and to have controls of our bodies, and look what's happening now. So it's one of those things where let's talk about the things that people really care about the state. Let's fight for those things. And these kind of side issues where um, Republicans think they can attack children or, or kind of these more marginalized communities because it'll get them votes, um, you know, that... We, we really, we shouldn't condone that. We shouldn't say that's okay. Okay, well, we're gonna go back to Sarah now, and I believe she has a senator with her. Sarah? Hi, Donna. We're here with Senator Clint Dixon. He's the chairman of the Senate Education and Youth Committee. Thank you for being here, Senator Dixon. Thank you, grateful to be here. 
All right, and so HB 1104, which you sponsored, passed the Senate just on Tuesday. So what motivated you to sponsor this bill? Yeah, I tell you, at the crux of the bill, it, what it does is it empowers parents, it, it informs them on the curriculum their kids are being taught in schools. Uh, it also gives them notification when their child checks a book out of school, and then it just it protects kids. And so how are you feeling about its prospects in the House? I'm feeling good. I, from what I understand, the speaker's taking it up. They may be making some changes to it, uh, but I believe the Save Girls sports portion of it and uh, dealing with the sex ed portion, I believe that's still in the bill. Mm -hmm. And so another bill of yours, SB 421, passed earlier this session. Can you explain what that bill does? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what it does is it, uh, it increases the penalties on swatting, uh, which happened to myself uh, twice. The first day was, uh, first time was on Christmas Day and uh, actually happened to several of my other Senate colleagues. It's a bipartisan bill. It's just a really a public safety issue. My good friend and seatmate in the Senate, uh, Kim Jackson, uh, was at home with uh, their three-year-old uh, that they had adopted, and it was their first Christmas together when they got swatted, and it was a horrifying situation for her family as well. And essentially what it does, currently the first offense is a misdemeanor, and we've elevated that if it's called to a home to a, a felony. Unfortunately, that's an issue that affects a lot of people. Yeah, really well, is. thank you so much for being here. We'll see what the Senate takes up uh, the rest of the night. Donna, back to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. So, so let's talk about the swatting bill. We've talked about some of the other things. The swatting bill was was important in the Senate in particular because not only was the lieutenant lieutenant governor swatted, but several members. Yeah, I think it's important, regardless if politicians yeah. get swatted or not. And for those who don't haven't heard they call it swatted because basically a SWAT team gets gets called in and usually what happens is there's a fake um, call that says that there's a dangerous situation a gunman whatever and then the police show up surround armed and you can imagine that this is not only stressful but if armed people show up at your door and you have a gun you can see where this really could cause folks to get hurt down the road. Yeah, it's pretty dangerous. Well, Jen's right, and it's it's past time we do this, especially with the polarization in all too many areas of legislation where some people don't like something and they try to target somebody with a SWAT. Yeah. All right, we're going to head back to Sarah at the Capitol. Who do you have now, Sarah? I'm here with Representative Shay Roberts. Uh, Representative Roberts, you've been a big proponent in increasing abortion access. What do you wish the legislature had done for the cause this year? It would have been nice to at least get a hearing on HB 475, which is the Georgia Reproductive Freedom Act. We know across the state, across this country, that women are tired of their rights being taken away. Reproductive care is health care, and it's dangerous for women. And the government needs to stay out of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so what future acts? actions are you planning on abortion access? Um, well, we will keep bringing the Reproductive Freedom Act. I think we're all kind of waiting for the court in Georgia to decide something, but we will continue to be loud. And, you know, I also filed the Representative Democracy Enforcement Act, which would have given us the right to do a ballot initiative on anything, uh, but that didn't get a hearing either. So we're trying everything we can, but I will say Alabama, the special election, two nights ago where she won by 25 percent after losing mm -hmm. by seven points in 2022 gave us great hope that going into mm -hmm. these elections women are ready to vote for uh, pro-reproductive mm -hmm. freedom yeah. candidates so mm -hmm. so not an issue that's over yet are there any bills that you're hoping to see passed by the end of the night um well we got to get the budget passed that's required um i think we're just at this point hoping to hold back some of the more harmful bills that mm -hmm. we've seen come through so, mm -hmm. gotcha. Well, we'll see what the rest of the night has in store. Thank All you right, so much for being here you. with us. Happy to be here. Donna, back to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, let's let's talk about the. Um, we we did not see the uh, as she mentioned the uh, anything dealing with abortion come up this session. It's an election year, so not a real surprise there. But how will it factor into possibly? the polls, when people go to the polls. What do you think? Look, I think it's important, and I think it's so important um, that you actually see a bipartisan effort coming out of the House. Um, Representative Terry Anelowitz as the Democrat, um, Scott Hilton, um, the, the Republican, with the support of the Speaker Burns, too, um, which is a resolution supporting access to IVF. Um, I think fertility issues and access to IVF is really going to be top of mind, especially after the Alabama Supreme Court came out um, and, and said basically embryos um, are extra uterine 
people with rights and there's a real concern of folks trying to expand their families right um, and trying to have more children that somehow that's going to be um, impacted by Georgia's um, abortion ban. Yeah, so um, we expect that IVF bill maybe to hit the floor tonight. We're yeah. thinking something might happen with that, I think. It's conceivable. There's yeah. a lot of bills, dozens right. and dozens that are making or won't make it. But just a couple comments quickly on the overall situation. I think abortion is obviously going to be an issue, but just one issue. I think when you uh, uh, talk to voters and look at the real clear politics polling, which is the average of all the polls in the country, and why is President Trump doing so well over Biden? It's because of the crazy open borders policy that's dangerous, and that's because of inflation. It's because of uh, uh, the lack of uh, energy independence. Uh, and so those are the issues. The pocketbook issues are still going to be super important. And also, all politics can be local. And so uh, you have to factor in with the with the demise of Roe by the U.S. Supreme Court. Abortion, a lot of people still don't understand this, is still now up to the all 50 state legislatures. So you can do bills and tweak whatever you want, but uh, I think that's where it should have been back in 1973 when the court uh, did row, and now it's been overturned. Yeah, what do you see as the issues? Uh, you mentioned, you know, abortion, but anything else? Look, I think, it's, the polls? I think it's individual freedoms. I think, I think it's about pocketbook issues. I think it's about people wanting government to stay out of their lives and just um, letting them raise their children, um, having healthy communities, having safe communities. I mean, that's the thing. If we don't talk about things in a very ideological way, I think what we realize is that we really do have a lot of the same priorities. We may have different ways of getting there, um, but if we can all just sit down, talk to each other and say, what's your priority in terms of how do you want to live and what kind of community do you want to live in? I think most of the time, Republicans and Democrats want the same thing. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both for coming on the show today. It's been great to have you. Great, great conversation. I love it. That does it for lawmakers today and for this session. Uh, so we will be having our break, but we want to talk about the team. We have a great team of people who are professionals who bring you this show. You're seeing some of their pictures up on the screen, screen pictures of people at the Capitol here in the studio. And I want to thank all of them for being a part of this. Uh, but for the latest in Georgia news, go to gpb.org and listen to your GPB radio station too. So thanks for watching us on Lawmakers. We've enjoyed bringing you the show.